the first chapter of Acts is our reading tonight. All the verses of Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at Matthias, the replacement apostle, in especially verses 15 through 26, which we'll only read once. All of Acts 1 then. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given <coughs> commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James, and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Asel Dama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed or proposed who Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, 
and Matthias. They prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Amen. <coughs> the occupants of the apostolic office, beloved, are the twelve and Paul. This, of course, raises some questions. What about Judas? Was he an apostle? And what about Matthias, who replaced him in Acts chapter 1? Was Matthias an apostle? Or was his appointment a mistake? What does all this teach us, too, about the apostolic office? which looms so large in the New Testament. What are the qualifications for an apostle? Did Matthias have the same qualifications as the eleven or Paul? And if he didn't, how did his qualifications differ? And what was unique about Matthias' call to the office? And when we're speaking here about this office of apostle, these issues are far from abstract or irrelevant to 21st century Christians because erroneous views of apostles are widely held today. In fact, I don't think it's overstating it to say that the majority of people in Christendom don't actually know what an apostle is. And they have people as apostles who are not apostles. The Church of Rome, Eastern Orthodoxy and Anglicanism in its various forms, they all hold to some form of apostolic succession, whether it's the leader of their denomination succeeds an apostle, or that episcopacy, that is church government by means of bishops, is derived by continuous succession from the apostles. The Mormons have their own apostles. Pentecostalism, charismaticism, and those groups that don't claim to have apostles in their own Pentecostal or charismatic fellowship are certainly open to it. Many evangelicals think that there are apostles today and some of them want to see a renewal of the office of apostles. And without that, we can't evangelize the nations. And the four or five-fold church government mentioned in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, and evangelists, these extraordinary, miraculous, and temporary offices, they say, have to be fully functioning in our own day. And of course, apart from withstanding these errors, we need to know the office and role of apostles to better grasp the New Testament writings, the New Testament church, and what really is New Testament Christianity? In the list of offices and office bearers given by the ascended Christ in Ephesians 4 verse 11, the apostles come first. Christ gave some apostles, that verse states. Ephesians 2 verse 20 declares that the church is built upon the foundation of the Apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here's the church, 
the chief cornerstone upon which all rests is the incarnate Son of God who died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And then we have the foundation which rests upon him being the apostles in their writings and teachings. So if you put somebody into the office of apostle who doesn't belong there, you're founding your church upon that liar. And you're in trouble. Let's now look at Matthias. He is a gift of the ascended Christ to his church. He is a part of that apostolic foundation of Christ's church. And he is this uniquely as the replacement apostle. Let's consider Matthias the replacement apostle. First the need for the replacement, the departure of Judas. And second, the call of the replacement, which is also found in Acts chapter 1. Now after the bodily ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven, which is related in the first 11 verses of Acts 1, what did the apostles do? Well, they returned to Jerusalem. First, they came back from Bethany, mentioned in Luke 24, the place from which Jesus ascended. They came west to the Mount of Olives. And then from the Mount of Olives, they returned to the Holy City, a distance, this last stage, of some 2,000 cubits or 3,000 feet, just over half a mile, which the Jews, according to Acts 1 verse 12, Call a Sabbath day's journey. Now the Bible doesn't say that there is a certain distance which you're allowed to walk on the Sabbath. And if you go beyond that, then you've sinned. The idea of a Sabbath day's journey was just another Pharisaic addition to God's law, legalism. But it became accepted language in that distance about half a mile or more. That was a Sabbath day's journey by anybody's reckoning. Why did the disciples then go to Jerusalem? Well, because Jesus Christ, just before he ascended into heaven, told them, go to Jerusalem and wait there for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which baptism, you understand, will come in Acts Chapter 2. Where do they then go within Jerusalem? Our text tells us it was an upper room. And it must have been a large upper room too. Because it contained some 120 people. So it's something of the order, let's say, of this auditorium. Maybe bigger, maybe smaller. But that's, that's sizable. There are very few people who own a house where you can fit 120 people in one room. One wonders if this upper room is the same upper room where Jesus ate the last supper on that Thursday with his disciples. Is this the same room where Christ met the 10 and then the 11? after his resurrection, John 20. Is this the same room in the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where Peter appeared after being released from prison in Acts 12? Maybe some of those rooms are the same rooms, but you can't really say 100% sure because the Bible doesn't identify them. Who was it then in this upper room in Jerusalem. Pride of place, so to speak, though without the pride, we have the disciples. Verse 13 says, When they were come in to Jerusalem, from Mount of Olives and beyond that Bethany where Christ had ascended, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode, that is, where stayed, both Peter and James, 
and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. And this list, of course, differs from all the other lists of the disciples found in the three first Gospels, Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, because it only mentions 11 men, not 12, since Judas Iscariot has by now betrayed Jesus and gone and hanged himself. And so we need a 12th man for the team, as it were. Verse 14 goes on to say that the women were there. And the women are presumably the women mentioned in Luke 8, some wealthy women who ministered of their substance to Jesus and the disciples, and other women who were there at Christ's tomb. So we're thinking here of Mary, the mother of James and John, Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven devils, Salome, Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and probably the disciples' wives, at least it's a possibility. For example, Peter, we're told, was married, because that's the only way in which you can get a mother-in-law. And Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law in Matthew 8. Then, of course, verse 14 specifies one particular woman, Mary, the mother of Jesus, which is the last time in the New Testament we read of a specific reference to Mary by Acts 1, her rule passes away. And then verse 14 concludes with a reference to Jesus' brethren. These, of course, were his half-brothers because he was born of the Virgin, as we heard this morning. These brothers are named in Matthew 13 as including James, he was later a leader of the church in Jerusalem, prominent at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, and I believe he was the human penman of the five chapters of James the letter. There was Joseph, Jude, I take him to be the one who wrote the penultimate book of the Bible as arranged in our Bibles, and Simon. All of these brothers half-brothers were younger than Jesus because, of course, he was the firstborn. Which brings up the issue of his sisters. And his sisters, Jesus' half-sisters, may also have been in this upper room included in the women. And by the way, John 7, verse 5, mentions that by that stage in our Lord's ministry... Jesus' half-brothers didn't believe him to be the Messiah. So now, now they do. So somewhere along the line between John 7 and Acts 1, they've been converted. It's interesting, though, that neither James nor Jude, the Lord's half-brothers who wrote the books of the New Testament named after them, neither of them are called apostles. They're not called apostles because they weren't apostles. They were prophets, but they wrote scripture, but they weren't apostles. Verse 26 says that Matthias was numbered with the 11 apostles. And having specified as far as we're able, using this text and drawing out what we can from other passages of Scripture, there must, of course, also have been several dozen other believers in that upper room since there were about 120 there, or at least there were 120 there, when Peter comes to give the speech which begins in verse 15. 
We're not to think, though, that these 120 or so spent all of the remaining few days before Pentecost in this particular chamber. Luke 24, for instance, tells us that the disciples were, quote, continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. So they were you know, moving out and about, going to that <coughs> temple of Herod. They would have slept, some of these 120 at the very least, they would have slept in other houses or lodgings at night. But when the 120 were here, according to verse 14, their chief activity gathered together was prayer. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, referring to the 11, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Prayer and supplication, they continued in it and with, with one accord, one purpose, one mind, they all continued in prayer, wrestling in prayer, because it's called supplication. And they're praying for the glory of Jesus Christ and the advancement of his kingdom through the outpouring of the promised Holy Spirit who was soon to be sent upon them from the glorified and risen Christ. In those days then, the scene having been set, Peter stood up before the 120 or so and gives us the speech recorded in verse 16 through 22 with the basic import, we need an apostle as a replacement for Judas. Peter begins by relating Judas' history. He talks about Judas in terms of his church office. Verse 17, he was numbered with us as one of the special disciples, as an apostle. And he had obtained part of this ministry. That is, Judas also was chosen by Jesus Christ, though Jesus knew all the time that he was both reprobate and the one who would betray him. And Jesus did that, we're told in the Gospel according to John, because he knew that the scripture had to be fulfilled. So Judas was chosen Judas was with Jesus. That was a large part of the idea of Christ's training of the twelve. They were to accompany him, speak with him, learn from him. And Judas was also sent by Jesus in order to preach and teach and to heal and exorcise demons. And he was sought to preach and teach, heal and exorcise demons just as much as as the other ones and he really did preach and teach and heal and exercise and he did it really and truly as opposed to the charlatans in the charismatic movement Judas actually did perform miracles huh and then we're told that Judas betrayed Jesus for money and everyone knows just exactly how much 30 pieces of silver and he became guide we're told this is the nice phrase that's used he was guide to them that took Jesus and that phrase of course carries us back to that night in the garden of Gethsemane where Judas came in front of all those men armed to the teeth and kissed Jesus indicating he's the one. Arrest him. And then of course later in remorse, unbelieving remorse, he committed suicide by hanging himself. And if you put Matthew 27, the other account of Judas's suicide, and 
Acts 1 together, what you get is this, that the rope upon which Judas hung himself, the rope apparently broke. He fell headlong, and apparently with some force, so he landed heavily, probably on something sharp, because his belly was torn open, and his bowels gushed out a particularly gruesome death. And the point is that this is what he deserved. Think of this horrible scene and fix it in your mind. He betrayed Jesus. He got in the providence of God, even in this life with this horrible death, what he deserved. Matthew 27 adds that earlier and before that last scene involving the traitor, Judas had taken the same 30 pieces of silver, the price of blood, and he had thrown it back to the chief priests and elders in the temple. And then with that blood money, the religious leaders bought the potter's field in order to bury strangers there. And Acts 1 verse 19 says, It was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, here's the word tongue, and it's not gobbledygook, the proper tongue, asel dama, and dama, that's from the word blood, and asel field, that is to say, the field of blood. Peter then continues the history, for want of a better word, the history, personal history of Judas, even beyond his death and the outpouring of his innards, in that after he died, he went, quote, to his own place. And that is, verse 25, that is a place of torment and punishment for all of his sins, and especially his sin of betraying the Messiah. And when it says he went to his own place, he went to a place of punishment that was specifically marked out for him and which he had well deserved. And this, of course, fits with Christ's term for him. He went to his own place. Fits with Christ's term for him, the son of perdition. And perdition is a noun which comes from the verb to perish. He's the son of perishing. And so Jesus teaches us that Judas Iscariot was eternally predestined to hell, that he earned hell and upon death went to hell as the son of perdition. And this, mind you, as the one who had been numbered with the twelve, and wrought miracles. You'll remember these words amongst the later words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. Many will say unto me in that day, the last day, the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Three things. Prophesied in my name, exorcised demons in my name, and wrought miracles in my name. And the first person probably the first person to die in this category as one who prophesied in Christ's name, wrought miracles in Christ's name, and exercised in Christ's name is Judas Iscariot. And there have been many false prophets and false miracle workers who have followed him in the last 2,000 years. And when we're there on the judgment day, we will doubtless think amongst all the awesome thoughts in the presence of Jesus Christ, 
seated on the great white throne of Matthew 7, that Jesus had told us all about this. That on that day, many who had said and done all these things, Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. I never knew you with the knowledge of love. Never. In time, in the decree, you must depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And in the first rank is the first person, probably in that category, in the New Testament, Judas Iscariot, who was there and heard the Sermon on the Mount live, so to speak. Now, as well as relating... Judas history Peter also reasons from the scriptures and did you know that the Psalter sings of Judas and in fact there are actually four Psalms minimum that sing of Judas Psalm 41 verse 9 yea mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me, behaved as a traitor towards me. Psalm 55, verse 12. It was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. And there are other verses in that psalm. And then we have Psalm 69, which we sang earlier, and Psalm 109, which we will sing later. Acts 1, verse 16. Men and brethren... This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. And it's interesting, it's going to go on and quote from the Psalms, it's interesting that it's saying, David is not merely speaking of Ahithophel, Ahithophel being the equal and helper of David who betrayed David, the Old Testament type of Christ the King, and who then went and hanged himself, <coughs> just like Judas. It says, The Holy Ghost by the mouth of David, in these Davidic Psalms, spake before concerning Judas, not only Ahithophel, Judas. And then Peter picks up this reference in verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, 1. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. That's Psalm 69, verse 25. And, quote two, his bishopric, or his office, or position, let another take. Psalm 109, verse 8. And both of these quotations from the Psalms, found in verse 20, have to do with replacement. The first verse, Psalm 69, teaches there will be no replacement for Judas in the home. That is, he's going to die and no one will fill in for him. Let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. No replacement in the home. And then secondly, his bishopric, his office, his function, his role in the church, let another take. Ah, he is going to be replaced on the other hand, in the apostolate. <coughs> and here we see how precise and accurate Scripture is, even in a prophecy, two prophecies written 1,000 years before. It doesn't say, let there be no replacement for Judas in the home, nor in the apostolate. 
It doesn't say either, let there be a replacement for Judas in his home. So that there's a new husband for his wife, a new father for his children. And let there be a replacement for him in the apostolate. Instead, and rightly, it says, let there be no replacement for him in the home, but let there be a replacement for him in the apostle. And this fits with the wisdom of the third person of the Trinity, because verse 16 says, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas. The Spirit wrote Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 precisely about Judas. Not replaced in the home, but replaced in his office as apostle. And here we see that Peter, Peter knew and appreciated Scripture. He knew and appreciated the Psalms, which he had sung throughout all his life Peter connected Psalm 69 verse 25 and Psalm 109 verse 8 he said they're speaking about the same person and that person is Judas Iscariot and recent events in and around Jerusalem huh. and this shows us a double need for the replacement apostle it's not only to make up the number 12 before the day of Pentecost because 12 is of course the number of the church 12 sons of Jacob 12 apostles but it is also that the scripture must be fulfilled and here we learn that the scripture must not only be filled in the death burial and resurrection of Christ because this is the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures but scripture must also be fulfilled in the replacement of Judas in the apostolate, the making up of the full complement of the twelve. The replacement apostle, as the first point of this sermon has it, the replacement apostle is necessary. We need someone to take Judas' place. And then, in verses 21 and 22, Peter lays down three qualifications for this replacement Apostle, because that's what he was. That's his distinctive and unique role among the twelve. First of all, the replacement apostle must be gasps of shock and awe. He must be a man and not a woman. Verse 21. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out, etc. And here again, we see from the scriptures that there is no such thing as a woman apostle. Actually, if I had to guess, there are probably actually more women who claim to be apostles today than men who claim to be apostles today. And there are thousands of them. <coughs> And there's just as much no such thing as a woman apostle as there's no such thing as a woman pastor or a woman elder or a woman deacon because Christ, speaking through the apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2 says, despite all the machinations and books and scholarship so-called, he says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. In silence, you understand, with regard to the function of offices in the church. And that's the will of the head of the church. It's his church. He's sovereign. And if he's sovereign in election and reprobation, the eternal destiny of human beings, he can determine whom he will to be in church office. And the vast majority of men aren't in church office either. 
Secondly, the replacement apostle must have been with the disciples during Christ's public ministry. Verse 21. All these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness. And this is very similar to the statement in Mark 3 verse 14 that Christ ordained 12 that they should be with him. The new apostle must have accompanied Jesus during the three years of his ministry to be able properly to represent him, to have known him in the flesh while on earth. And this time period is very specific. Beginning, verse 22 says, from the baptism of John, when Jesus was baptized that day by the river Jordan, and all the time later until he was taken up from us. And so of the 120, let's say half of them were men, half of them were women, so we're down to something like, like 60. And then of course 11 of them were already apostles, so now we're down to something like 50. Well, if someone was in that upper room and they had only started following Jesus for the last six months of his ministry, or for the last two years of his ministry, that was them disqualified from being an apostle. They, could, they couldn't have served in that role. And then the third thing, got to be male, got to accompany Jesus through all of his ministry. The third thing, they must have seen the risen Lord. Because it says, we've got to ordain one to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that on one occasion Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. And then all their references in 1 Corinthians 15 in the latter chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John refer to him appearing to various parties, including, let's say, the two on the Emmaus Road. They may have been there. They may have been in the 500. They may have been in this upper room. But you could imagine someone who was with Jesus from his baptism all the way to the end but wasn't in the 500 or any of the others of those groups so that means that that person was ruled out too. And by the way, this gives us at least one reason why Peter had the 120 present when he gave that speech. It wasn't that he was saying you are the sort of core of the the new church. And I want you now to vote for a replacement apostle. Apostles aren't voted in any way. Apostles are not elected by men. They are appointed by God directly, even here, by means of the lot. The 120 are here, number one, so out of that group, someone can be picked who has the three qualifications, male with Jesus through the whole time of his public ministry and saw the resurrection. And secondly, the 120 are there so that they can be witnesses that God has chosen one replacement apostle out of their midst. So out of the 120 here, there are only two people, only two people who had the three qualifications that we have seen. Men, men with Jesus during his public ministry from the earliest days and onwards, and men who had seen the risen Christ. And here it's instructive to note how the qualifications for apostle differ from those of <coughs> elders, whether teaching and ruling, ministers or elders, and deacons. Though, of course, all of them must be men, but 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, in their qualifications for the permanent, ordinary offices, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 speak of qualifications in the realm of gifts and piety. 
And here in Acts chapter 1 for the apostolate, it doesn't say like it does in Acts 6 with regard to deacons, search us out now, godly men who are filled with the Holy Spirit, men of wisdom. It doesn't mention any of the, the ability, piety gifts. These things are assumed, you understand. Instead, beyond the gender issue, male, there are two qualifications mentioned which are time-bound. Ah, you can see where this is going. Two time-bound qualifications. You have to have been with Jesus during his public ministry of, say, three years, and you have to be witnesses of his resurrection so that you saw the Lord come back to life in glorified form after his crucifixion. And this leads, of course, to the two obvious questions that have to be put to all claimants to the apostolic office from the 2nd century to the 21st century, and even until the return of our Lord, you say you're an apostle. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, we've seen this nonsense before. But anyway, just to carry through, right, you say you're an apostle, right. Were you with Christ during his public ministry of three years? Beginning, let's just rub it in a little, beginning with the baptism of John, were you there by the banks of the river Jordan? Were you there at the Sermon on the Mount? Were you there for those three years? Were you? Uh, uh, no, well, come on. Sit down and catch yourself on. And secondly, were you a witness of Christ's resurrection? I mean, we don't read about you in 1 Corinthians 15. You didn't pop up in the last chapter or two of the four Gospels. Did I miss something? I mean, what are you claiming here? Do you, real, you say you're an apostle. Do you realize what an apostle is? An infallible teacher of the word of God. Someone who can work miracles. Someone who can perform amazing deeds. Who always teaches the truth. Who has direct revelation from God and speaks by divine inspiration. Is this what you mean by an apostle? Uh, uh, yeah. You're a con man. A con man. And... You don't have the qualifications. You're no witness of the risen Christ. You have been exposed. Repent of your evil deeds. You're a charlatan. And just as the church in Revelation 2 was commended in Ephesus for exposing false apostles, so you have been exposed as a false apostle. Now don't mention that ever again. You're only leading people astray. Someone might say, though, what about Paul? He wasn't with Christ during our Lord's public ministry. In fact, Paul was an unbeliever back then. Well, Acts chapter 1 gives qualifications for the 12 apostles. They were all male. They were with Christ from his baptism up to the end and they, all twelve, saw the risen Lord. Paul is in a slightly different category, an exceptional category. He wasn't there for those three years, true, but he emphatically did see the risen Christ. And if we move to this one, this one question is enough to expose all self-designated apostles today. Have you seen the risen Christ in his body? Have you had an experience like that on the Damascus road? I mean, really. I don't want to hear about your adventures into hell and all the things that you saw. Dante dealt with that in the Middle Ages. And I don't want to hear about your mysterious journeys through all the realms of heaven. Because quite frankly, I think I could make up better myths and stories than you could because it's pathetic, did you really look me in the eye? And they didn't either. And now, with the 120 in that upper room reduced to two, another step must be taken, because it isn't, this chapter isn't dealing with two replacement apostles. It's dealing with one replacement apostle. The two men 
that have fulfilled the three criteria mentioned, the two men are one with three names, Joseph, Barsabbas, Judas. That's the man with three names. Joseph comes from a Hebrew word to add, although he actually isn't added to the apostolate as a replacement. Bar Sabbath means that his father was Sabbath, because Bar means uh, son of. And Justice, righteous, that's a, a Latin name. And then the other one, just as one given name, Matthias. These are the two men, as it were, left standing for the choice. And now the next question is, how are they going to determine which of the two is to be the replacement apostle? As I've said, it's not going to be a vote. It's not like, we'll say, in a church where you have two men up for elder or deacon, and then the congregation votes for one of the two, and the one with the most votes is elected. Apostles are chosen directly by God. The answer is, they're going to be chosen by God through a lot. And this is actually the only case of lots in the New Testament. They were used especially in the book of Joshua in order to divide up the promised land among the 12 tribes. And lots were used to identify Achan as the thief who stole valuable goods which were to be devoted to destruction. Lots were used to determine the order of the various courses of priests to serve at the temple in 1 Chronicles 24, and they were used to work out who was the troublemaker for whom God sent the storm in that boat mentioned in Jonah chapter 1. Now if you say, how did the lots work? Some say, well, perhaps they had two urns, and an urn won the names. Joseph and Matthias, and then an urn to a blank or apostle. So you pick one name, and then you pick, and then it comes out this person's name, either blank or an apostle. Others say, well, there were just two names. They were shaken in some sort of a box. And one that flew out first, that's the apostle. Ultimately, we don't know the mechanism, just as we actually don't know the mechanism for much, many of those other instances by which lots were drawn. But we do know this, because Proverbs 16, verse 33 says it. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And this use of the lot, when all the qualifications were worked out, came in the fear of God and with prayer. Verses 24 through 25, they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show which of these two men thou hast chosen, so that he may take part of the ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, so that he might go to his own place. They gave forth the lots, verse 26 continues, and the lot fell upon Matthias. Now, this does not mean that there was some secret sin in Joseph. Not at all. I'm sure Joseph was a very godly man. He just wasn't here chosen to be an apostle. In the same way, if you have an election for two men, let's say, for elder or, or deacon, and one man isn't chosen, you don't leave church and say, oh, you know, I dare say that guy had some strange behavior in the Lord. No, no, you don't think anything on charity like that. This man was chosen in the sovereign purpose of God. This Matthias... One wonders, was he one of the 70 whom Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10? We don't know. We can't know in this life. Tradition says that Matthias went to Ethiopia. You can assess whether that tra tradition is likely to be true or not. 
I personally don't put a whole lot of confidence in it. We know that he is not mentioned again by name in the Bible, but then most of the disciples aren't mentioned again by name later in the Bible. But those references to the apostles or the twelve include him just as much as, let's say, Bartholomew. I should add, though, that there are some people who think wrongly that Matthias being numbered with the eleven was a mistake. And they say, once we get rid of Judas, we should have just stayed with that. Because then, with the eleven, plus Paul, who's brought in in Acts 9, we shouldn't have brought this guy in in Acts 1, then we have twelve. But one way to understand this is to think of the number of tribes in the Old Testament. The land of Israel is divided up into 12 allotments. But then there was Levi. And Levi, the tribe of Levi, got 48 cities. So how many tribes were there? Well, we talk about the 12 tribes, but there was sort of 13. And likewise, we talk about the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles, but there were sort of 13. There's 12 plus 1. The Apostle Paul. And we should add that all of the other 11 apostles were there. They approved of all this. And that Paul, the other apostle, who wasn't there, he nowhere criticizes Matthias or Peter or any of the other ones for their actions in Acts chapter 1. And he doesn't do this, though he had opportunity, because in his epistles, like 1 Corinthians 9, he has opportunity and refers to the true apostles, just as he also deals with false apostles, especially 2 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12. And in fact, Acts 1, besides being inspired, Acts 1 even tells us that God had already chosen Matthias as an apostle even before the events recorded in this chapter and this makes sense too Judas was the son of perdition before the foundation of the world before he ever betrayed Christ or before he ever wickedly committed suicide and Matthias was the replacement apostle before the foundation of the world and Peter understood this and stated this Verse 24, here's the prayer. Lord, thou, thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show which of these two thou hast chosen. Lord, by the lot, show us which of the two men, Joseph or Matthias, thou hast already chosen. And that was the purpose of the lot. Not actually to make the choice, but to reveal what God's choice had been all along, even before the foundation of the world. And if there is a kingdom prepared for us before the foundation of the world, then the names of the twelve apostles that are written on the foundation of this kingdom, think Revelation chapter 21 and 22, well, they were written on this foundation of this kingdom before the foundation of the world. And here they are. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and all the rest, and Matthias, not Judas. Never Judas. And so this replacement apostle, he's not only prophesied, prophesied, in the Psalms, repeatedly, including this word, that his bishopric or office let another take, Psalm 109, verse 8, he was not only prophesied, but he was predestinated. This replacement apostle, predestinated, eternally chosen, not only to salvation, but to the apostles. Let Judas's bishopric let another take. Ah, Matthias, and not just Judas, is prophesied in Psalm 109. Let Judas's office, let another, Matthias, take according to the divine.
predestination of God. And the casting of the lots was merely to show the 11 apostles and the other 109 or so, or I should say 108 or so, and Matthias himself know whom God had eternally chosen. And finally, there were no other replacement apostles. When Judas defected and went over to the other side, so to speak, although in his heart he was always on that side, but when he publicly went over to the other side, Judas was replaced. In Acts chapter 12, the apostle James died. No replacement. The others, as the years rolled by, died. Most, if not all, of them were martyred. No replacements. And there is no data in Scripture for apostolic succession for any of the twelve generally, that they laid hands and that their line is continued through this guy whom they appointed, which goes to that guy whom they appointed, not for any of the twelve, and not for Peter specifically, because the Pope claims he is the successor of Peter. And the proper response is, you are the successor of one apostle, not Peter, Judas. If apostolic succession, so to speak, is for anyone, Judas. That's where you belong. And so it is that when the twelve died, as they all did in time, and when Paul died, they weren't replaced the 12 mentioned here in Acts 1 and Paul, they weren't replaced because in the purpose and determination of God, they weren't replaced because they were irreplaceable. They were irreplaceable. And they were, the 12 apostles, with Matthias included in that 12, and Paul, they were irreplaceable, not only because they, with Paul, were the last to see the risen Christ before he returns again, but they were irreplaceable because the apostles are the foundation of the church. And you don't replace the foundation. This is a building. You can replace the light bulbs, and they do need to be replaced every now and again, though I see we're all, they're all working at the minute. You can replace cupboards that are broken you can replace the oven if the element goes but you don't replace the foundation and that is Ephesians 2 verse 20 with which we began at least near the start the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets you don't replace real divinely inspired prophets either with Jesus Christ himself the chief cornerstone. The prophets and the apostles, the foundation, they proclaimed Christ. The sole king and saviour of the church, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we honour the apostles, the twelve, including Matthias and Paul, we honour the apostles when we look for all of our salvation and bliss in the name of Jesus Christ alone. And if you bring in other prophets and you look to other apostles, you forsake the foundation of God's revelation and the cornerstone. And you destroy the church. The church crumbles because it has no proper foundation. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word and give us a holy contentment, not only with our lives and role and place in the kingdom and in our families, but Lord, contentment with thy word and the revelation given to us that we may grow deeper into that. Increase our faith and deepen our love, for we pray in Jesus Christ, our Saviour's name. Amen.